Good evening, everybody joining us in the Zoom room and uh, now on Facebook Live as well. I'm Jonathan Haupt, Executive Director of our nonprofit Pat Conroy Literary Center here in Beaufort, coming to you tonight from the brand new Conroy Center here at 601 Bladen Street. Uh, you can see some of it behind me and over the course of our three days of March 4th this year, you'll get to see more and more of the center as we'll be live streaming our hosting duties from different rooms in the center and doing a full on virtual tour of the center uh, Sunday morning as well. And if you've not yet registered for the weekend's events, I'll be putting a note in the chat about how you can do that uh, as we get underway here this evening. Thank you for those of you who have already discovered our chat function. Yeah, if you want to let us know where you're watching from and say hello in the chat, by all means do that. We have uh, quite a group joining us tonight. I'm glad to see so many of you have already logged on and joined us. So let us know where you're watching from. That's always wonderful to hear. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what March 4th is, and then I will uh, very happily introduce uh, Bruce Feiler and Reverend Patrick Perryman to take over the conversation for tonight, our, our opening event for our three-day March 4th. This is an event that commemorates the passing of that handsome guy whose uh, face is all over the wall behind me, our friend, my mentor, family member, and champion to many of you watching out there tonight, Pat Conroy, passed away March 4th of 2016. It was a day of, of tremendous loss and sadness for us, a day that let us feel what uh, Pat's friend Ann River Siddons later described as the Pat Conroy shaped hole in our hearts. And our nonprofit Pat Conroy Literary Center grew out of that as, a, as an opportunity for us to try and literally march forth in Pat's absence to continue his gracious work as champion and mentor to readers and writers and teachers and students. And that's the great uh, life of service that we get to live here at the Conroy Center day by day. March 4th as a program began on the first anniversary of Pat's death and a partnership that we carried out with Penn Center, Historic Penn Center out on St. Helena Island, uh, very near where Mr. Conroy is buried, something that we think of as Pat's last act as a teacher. And that first year, it was a relatively small, intimate event, uh, perhaps 60 people in attendance, uh, mostly from right here in Beaufort County. It was a, a lovely, meaningful day spent in celebration of some of the major themes of Pat's writing life, and it grew. And it continued to grow and it grows still. And here we are now in our fifth year of marching forth on this anniversary, our first year to do it virtually. And our registration is larger than any year before uh, with more people attending and from farther away than have ever attended before as I can already see in our chat. Uh, and it's so meaningful to all of us to get to share this anniversary with you. I'll tell you a little bit about the partnership that makes March 4th possible as well. Uh, this is a program that we would not be able to do without the very kind folks out at Penn Center who will be joining us this weekend as well. Nevermore Books, a wonderful independent bookstore right here in town. The Beaufort County School District and this year for the first year ever, First Presbyterian Church of Beaufort joining us in the March 4th partnership as well. This year's event is also sponsored by our friends at South Carolina Humanities, a not-for-profit organization inspiring, engaging, and enriching South Carolinians with programs on history, culture, and heritage. And we're so grateful to all of our partners and our sponsors and our presenters, and certainly all of you attendees and our volunteers and our board members who make this signature annual program possible. For the first few years of March 4th, this program was sponsored by Aaron and Matt Devlin, and uh, they've, they've never attended March 4th. They've never been able to. They don't live here in the Low Country or even in South Carolina or even in these United States, but this program had been very meaningful to them, and they gave generously to make it possible. And tonight, for the first time, because March 4th is virtual, Aaron and Matt are out there in Zoom land watching tonight. So welcome to you both. I'm glad you get to participate this year. And thank you so much for your generosity in making this possible. We're going to go for about an hour tonight. And I mentioned that uh, so I can tell you this. Uh, by the time that we're done here in our Zoom room, it'll be a little after 7 o'clock more or less the same time that Mr. Conroy passed away on March 4th of 2016. 
And what I'd love for you all to do is take a moment after we leave our Zoom room here and do something with great love, as Pat liked to say, whatever that means for you. Call someone, text someone, talk to someone in the room that you care about and let them know, let them know that because time slips away so quickly. And we all need to share that great love in whatever way we can. Certainly that's the spirit of March 4th and our Conroy Center. Let me tell you about who we have about to appear on screen here tonight, uh, because this is a very special program in a lot of ways. We're gonna welcome two presenters whose lives intersected with Pat's both on the page and in person in curious and inspiring ways, which I think resonate in their own lives of service as well. And it's a great honor to welcome both New York Times bestselling author, Bruce Feiler, and the Reverend Dr. Patrick Perryman of Beaufort's First Presbyterian Church for this evening's conversation about Bruce's most recent book, Life is in the Transitions. And here's the point where ordinarily I would hold up a copy of the book, but I sent mine to prison where it's uh, actually been quite meaningful to some of the writers I work with at the Allendale Correctional Institute. And the book has been meaningful to many readers and writers I've worked with here in Beaufort and well beyond. It's a book that I got to review for the Charleston Post and Courier when it came out. And I've gotten to talk to Bruce about this book uh, on behalf of the Southern Festival of Books last fall. So I'm very excited to welcome him back to our Conroy Center. Bruce is the author of six consecutive New York Times bestsellers, including The Secrets of Happy Families, Council of Dads, which of course made into a TV series, Walking and Walking the Bible. He's the writer and presenter of two primetime series on PBS, and his two TED Talks have been viewed more than two million times. A low country native of Savannah, Bruce now lives and writes in Brooklyn with his wife and their twin daughters. He's known for living the experiences he writes about and his work resonates with a timeless wisdom that also incorporates very timely knowledge, which in turn results in this practical, often pragmatic and entirely positive message about how people can live with more meaning, passion and joy, which we all need more of in our lives. His newest book and the subject of tonight's conversation is Life is in the Transitions, Mastering Change at Any Age. And it was a top 10 New York Times bestseller. And that book describes Bruce's journey across America, collecting hundreds of life stories, exploring how we can navigate the growing number of life transitions we encounter with greater purpose and skill. Bruce is a masterful storyteller and his stories resonate with the stories of so many others because he is a collector of stories as Pat Conroy was a collector of stories. And while Bruce writes with great hope and optimism, both of which are tremendously important, that writing is also backed up with research and data and wonderful things that convince us that yes, these things are true, they are possible, they can be incorporated into our lives. And I'm just completely honored to be able to welcome Bruce tonight. Since I've already gotten to interview him once, uh, I'm very happy to turn those duties over to someone else, another great friend of our Conroy Center here. Patrick Perryman is senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Beaufort, where he has served since 2010. Reverend Perryman has been in ordained ministry for more than 22 years and holds a Master of Divinity from Columbia Theological Seminary and a Doctor of Ministry from Fuller Theological Seminary. He lives here in Beaufort with his wife, Sissy, and their two teenagers, uh, Walker and Holland. And Holland is, of course, very familiar to us here at the Conroy Center. She's my student intern, and she'll be co-hosting this weekend's events as we continue to march forth. And I understand we may have a cameo appearance from Walker as well. One of the ways we measure growth uh, here in Beaufort is by the number of Perryman family members you can incorporate on screen into an event. Last year, it was just one. Uh, this year, it could be as many as three. So that too is reflective of how much March 4th has grown. With all of that said, uh, let me welcome to our virtual stage, your presenters for this evening. Please welcome Bruce Feiler and Patrick Perryman. Well, Jonathan, thank you for um, that introduction. And uh, we won't probably see anybody from the family. I am actually at my office um, trying to avoid the dogs barking and all of the other attendant things that might happen. Um, Bruce, it is an honor to be here with you. Um, I told you 
earlier when we corresponded that I have been a fan of your work for a number of years. I um, actually was looking through my books and found there was a package when I came to Beaufort about 10 years ago. Um, I used to host a book club in our church and we had read one or two of your books in that club. And um, when I moved here, uh, a couple of the members gave me a copy of Walking the Bible, the book and the video. Wow. And I already had watched the video and had the book. So they still are, I'll show you, I've still got them bound up as a little package memento that stays on my shelf. Uh, you mentioned that in, in some of your work, having some of those things that you can look at and remember, uh, because it reminds me of that group and the time that we spent together and um, just appreciate your taking the time to come home, even if it's uh, sort of virtually to the low country and uh, would love to, for, for you to tell us a little bit about how you got started on this particular, um, this particular work, uh, Life is in the Transitions. Well, I'll be happy to do that. Let me just first um, thank you for that kind uh, introduction and with apologies for all the space on your bookshelf that I appear to be occupying, but I'm grateful that, that, that my work has you know, sort of triggered these conversations uh, between and among you and your, and your colleagues and, and, and your journeys. And um, I didn't quite hear the invitation over to Sunday dinner um, with the, uh, with the Perry Mints, but I'll, 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 as a point of privilege, accept that. And I'm just Absolutely. thinking of your daughter. When Jonathan interviewed me at the Southern Festival in October, I think he quoted your daughter in a question to me, and I'm just I'm tickled that you're here and it reminds me that you know nepotism begins at home. So I'm glad that you're here <laughs> supporting her. And, and I just want to remark on Jonathan's kind, you know, not only his kind introduction, but his service both to Pat and to the idea of writing and writers in the low country. And I'm sure we'll get into this you know, later, but I was deeply affected and, and influenced and inspired by Pat as a young person wanting to be a writer in this part of the world. And uh, I, I did this thing, I, I, I've been tickled because uh, I, I wrote a book on Abraham, as you know, and sort of the iconic moment in Abraham is when God says, go forth from your native land uh, to the land that I will show you. And so go forth is sort of this big phrase in my life. And now I have March 4th. I actually can remember being in Miami on March 4th, the night that Pat died and, mm. and seeing that news kind of flash before me and literally on my bed, kind of breaking down in tears and in memory of all he's meant to me. And I don't know anybody who's met him or read him who hasn't been affected by him in some way. So to be here five, five years later on this night is, is meaningful uh, for me personally. And I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later. But to answer your question, you know, in a lot of ways that this journey, like so many journeys of mine, began uh, in the low country, in this case, a call from my mother. So for those of you who don't know, I grew up in Savannah, five generations of Georgians left there and, uh, and went to Yale in the 80s, left there and went to Japan to teach, not unlike Pat going to Tufusky, except that it's nothing like that, but it was everything <laughs> like that to me at the time. And I would write letters home on kind of crinkly airmail paper. And when I got back to Georgia, six months later, everywhere I went, I, mean, I can remember this vision of like being in a square in downtown Savannah and someone coming up to me saying, I love your letters. And I was like, great, have we met? And it turned out that my grandmother had Xeroxed them and passed them around and they had gone viral in a sort of old fashioned sense of the word. And I, I thought, wow, this is that interesting to me and all these people like, I should write a book about this. I actually never tell this story, but since I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm, I'm at home tonight, I'll tell, I actually went to the Chatham Effingham County Public Library on Bull Street in downtown Savannah and checked out the only book on publishing they had, which was a book about propaganda in World War II. <laughs> And I thought, well, this isn't going to be very much help. Um, and it doesn't happen this way, but I sold my first book at 24, uh, you know, uh, 32 years ago. And I've never held a job since. And in my 20s, I wrote these books about Japan and England. I spent a year as a circus clown. It was in my 30s that I wrote the Bible books that you refer to, Walking the Bible, uh, Where God Was Born, Abraham, a book about Moses. And you know, this, in the context of the conversation we're about to have, I think of now as a kind of a linear life, like, right, I figured out what I wanted to do early. I did it for no money. I found some success. I got married. I got children. Excuse me, I had children. But then in my 40s, I was just walloped by life. And so this journey, back to your initial question, begins with a call from my mother 
saying that my father who has Parkinson's has gotten very depressed and has tried to take his own life. And this kind of creates this controversy, not this controversy, this crisis, as you can imagine, this is on the heels of getting cancer at 43 as a new dad, the heels of the recession, which hit my family very hard. And now we have this crisis and we, my, my family in a lot of ways is sort of hyper-functional. So we're sort of all swarming together trying to solve this problem. And we're dealing with medical issues and financial issues. But I'm the story guy and I've always been the story guy and I'm the meaning guy and I've always been the meaning guy. And so kind of on one Monday morning, I send my dad an email with a question, like tell me about the toys that you played with as a kid. And he answered that question and I was like, okay, this is interesting. And then I sent him another one. Tell me about the house you grew up in. And I begin to do this, as you know, Patrick, week after week, it's now been seven and a half years. And in the course of this time, my father has managed to write, this is someone who never wrote anything longer than a memo in his life, a 52,000 word autobiography that literally as we speak, we are editing and preparing to bring into the world. And so you know, when this happens, these kinds of events, our instinct is not to talk about it. We don't want to admit to ourselves, to our friends that we're in pain, that we're in struggling, that we're, that we're just, that we're in a, in a challenging place in some way. But I did, when I started and kind of got the courage to begin to tell people about this experience, it turned out that everybody else had a similar experience where mm -hmm. their life was upended in some way. And so I, I was actually at a college reunion and people were starting to tell these stories because I had mentioned this from a dais. And I called my wife, Linda, that night and I said, no one knows how to tell their story anymore and I've got to figure out how to help. And you know, now it's about disruptors and transitions and in a lot of ways now it's about the pandemic and this moment that we're all in, but it didn't begin that way. It began as a storytelling exercise. Let me go talk to people, ask them to tell their story and let me listen and let me see if there's some ideas or patterns or themes or takeaways that emerge from these conversations. Wow. That, um... As you were describing that, I was thinking uh, that your your life was uh, you know major family crisis with your father, uh, major financial crisis, and then major health crisis. All of these things together, and then what comes out of it is not just your telling the story, but that next step of how do I encourage and uh, more than encourage really give some concrete ways to get at it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've sort of poured through the book and gone back and forth. It's, uh, you know, if I have more than th two or three different colors that I'm writing in when I'm writing in the margins, that's always a good sign for me. Um, but could you talk a little bit about uh, some of those, some of those patterns uh, and some of those tools? I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth, not knowing who already has read it so we can go re really deeper, uh, but also wanting to kind of trace out. Um, I, I would just be very candid for everybody who's watching. Um, my goal in, in the conversation that you and I are having is for people to go and get this book and use this book. And then like Jonathan has done and like I have done, send this book to somebody else uh, because I really believe that it's, it's helpful, that it's one of those things that has... In some ways, because you don't follow it, you don't have to be linear in it. I mean, you can talk to us a little bit about that in a minute, perhaps, but um, you can dip in and out and find tools all along the way, um, as well as it's just packed with stories, wonderful you know, opportunities to, to be uh, in sort of an empathetic and compassionate relationship with people that, that I've never even met, that you, you got to spend time with. So. Well, first of all, I appreciate that. And um, I, I'm, that means a lot to me. And I will just point out, because Jonathan just put this in the chat, that I actually signed some book plates and sent them off to Buford so we can also support a local bookseller in Buford if you are in Buford and you can get a signed copy of the book. And that was my, my honor to do it. Let, let me just jump on that word you just talked about, about non about nonlinear. And let, let's just go from this high level that, that I was in. And I will, yeah, just to acknowledge you talked about the people. Yes, I went out and I collected what became hundreds of life stories of Americans of all ages, all walks of life, all 50 states. People who lost homes and lost limbs and changed careers and changed religions and got sober and got out of bad marriages. And then I went through this whole process of 
kind of combing through them, looking for these themes and patterns and takeaways. And so to kind of get to the point you're talking about, I would say that the big idea that emerged from this is, you know, number one, the linear life is dead, right? So the idea that we're gonna have one home, one relationship, one job, one spirituality, one source of happiness from adolescence to assisted living is deader than it's ever been. And let's remember that is actually how we grew up. And if I could just sort of take a step back and do a little bit of kind of big think about what's going on in the world, there was this kind of, you know, I feel like we should talk about writing and process in deference to Pat tonight, but there was this moment for me where I pulled a book off a shelf and the, not only did the book end up in my hand, but the shelf opened up and there was this other room, that kind of childhood fantasy that we all have. And what was in this other room was an idea that was entirely new to me, which is the idea that how we look at the world affects how we look at our lives. So in the ancient world, they don't have clocks. There's no linear time. So they think that the world, that, that, that the world is a cycle because it's a seasonal thing. And they think that humans live seasonally, right? To every season, turn, turn, turn. The Bible, back to the Bible, um, as it inevitably comes, introduces in the West the idea of linear time. And so by the Middle Ages, they think life is a staircase up to middle age, and then it's downhill from there. Hmm. And that might sound obvious, but it's also profound. That means no new love at 40. That means no getting divorced and finding happiness at 50. That mean, doesn't mean you move to South Carolina, the coast of South Carolina or Georgia and open up a B&B or an Airbnb or whatever it might be. Like it's straight up and then it's straight down. And really with the birth of science 150 years ago, we are introduced in the West to this idea that life is gonna follow a linear arrow of progress. It really, I should be doing this. Like hmm. that life is always going to go up and you name it, Freud with stages of psychosexual development, Piaget, childhood development, Erickson, the eight stages of moral development, the hero's journey, uh, the five stages of grief. These are all linear constructs. And this reaches its peak with Gail Sheehy in the 70s, who writes this book that all of our mothers read called Passages, which says everyone does the same thing in their 20s and their 30s. And everyone has a midlife crisis um, in their 40s, specifically between 39 and 44 and a half. And that idea, that's what popularizes the idea of a midlife crisis. And that's all very powerful, but it turns out to be totally bunk. But that's actually not how we live, and yet this becomes fact as a result. And now what's happened of late is that we now understand that there's chaos theory or complexity. The internet has shown that we live networked lives, and as a result, influences come from all sides and all directions. Witness, I might add, the pandemic. Like if you're between 39 and 44 and a half, the pandemic perhaps has created a midlife crisis for you. But if you're a teenager, as your daughters and my daughters, you're having a crisis. If you're in your 80s, as my parents, you're having a crisis. So the point is these crises come out, some people are born into um, a nonlinearity if their parents perhaps have alcoholism or getting divorced. Some people lose a parent in childhood as my children almost did. You know, some, I talked to Seth Mnookin uh, in my book who is addicted in his twenties to heroin, the highlight of his life at 26, he's living in his car when he gets sober and begins to go on a path of restoring his life. He's now a tenured professor at MIT. So these moments come at us whenever in a nonlinear pattern, right? So the idea that they're all gonna clump around birthdays that end in zero is just not true. So back to my big thesis, big idea that emerges, the linear life is dead. It's been replaced by what I now coin and is now catching on as the nonlinear life. And my data showed we have one disruptor. We have three dozen in our lives. Could be as small as a fender bender or twisting your ankle, as big as losing a loved one or having your house burned down. We go through three dozen of these in our lives. Most of them we get through relatively quickly. That's one every 12 to 18 months. I mean, that's more often than many people see a dentist. But then one in 10 of those becomes what I call a life quake, like this huge kind of tsunami of change in our lives. Some are voluntary, some are involuntary, but those then last three, four, five years to get through. And if you do the math, as I have done, three to five in a lifetime, four or five years, that's 25 years, that's half of our adult lives that we are in periods of transition, which leads to the third big point, which is these are a skill that we can and must master. Like basically transitions are a lifelong skill that no one's teaching us how to play. And that's, as you said, what this book emerges into after I sort of walk through the opening ideas of, okay, we're gonna spend half our lives in transition. How can we get better at them? And what should we be doing? Yeah. 
Yeah, it it reminds me a little bit. Um, Simon Sinek has a book that I think came out last year called The Infinite Game, where he talks about how there are finite games that have rules and a time set and winners and losers, and it's obvious. And then there are infinite games, which is how you know we continue to be going back and forth and back and forth. But sometimes we are in we're living our life as if it's a finite game when in fact it's an infinite game. And when you talk about that life is in the transitions, it's funny listening to you talk about it. It's almost like that little part of the subtitle ought to be the big bold sort of bullet point in the middle of the cover that says, how do we live in the midst of those transitions? Because what you just described says that's where you are going to be. And uh, I think the pandemic seems to have given us uh, an even greater sense that um, we are going to be living in a world where loopiness and chaos and pushing and pulling, um, all those things that on the surface might feel entirely negative, uh, but don't necessarily have to be. But that, that, I don't know, that piece about getting into the transition, living in the transition, and then moving out of the transition. Talk a little bit, if you will, about um, that sort of sequence. So I would say um, a couple of things here. I mean, first of all, let me make this point. So, so, so the life quakes that come at us are one of two things. They're either voluntary or they're involuntary. 53% are involuntary, 47% are voluntary. When I first came up with this number, I looked at this and I was like, wow, 47% of the people you know, initiate their own life quakes, right? They leave a job to start something new. They move, okay? Um, they, uh, they get married or choose to change their degree of religiosity. Like th they're embracing the opportunities of the nonlinear life. And I had a bunch of millennials on my team and they look, were looking at, I was born in 64, which is technically the tail end of the baby boom. And these millennials look at this like, well, 53% are involuntary. Like I don't control my life. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and by the way, depending even in a family, like an involuntary uh, uh, life quake might be that your spouse cheats on you, but a voluntary life quake might be you cheat on your spouse, right? So even within a family, like there's a kind of subtle difference there. So, the, but the, I tell all that to say that the life quake could be voluntary or involuntary, but the life transition that comes out of it must be voluntary. You must lean in and choose to go through the steps. So what are the steps? So I would say based on my experience, that there are kind of two types of people when they go into a life transition. There's either make a 217 item to-do list and say, I'm gonna get through it this weekend and I'm gonna be, you know, get a gold medal and a blue star or whatever it is, a blue star and a gold medal, whatever it is. That would be my wife totally. Like I'm gonna be the best ever at getting to this transition. And then there's a lot of other people who uh, lie in a fetal position under the covers and then under those, whatever, those heavy blankets they seem to sell all over the internet and say, this has never happened to anybody. Oh, woe is me, I'm never gonna get through this. Well, neither is right. <laughs> um, but so here's the thing that, that, that you look, enough, look at enough of them as I have done and you notice that there's a certain pattern to them. So as you alluded to, life transitions have three phases. There's the long goodbye, where you accept that it's emotional and sort of say goodbye to the life that, that you're leaving behind. There's what I call the messy middle, where you shed certain habits and experiment and try and use creativity to, to um, you know, to, to try on new habits. And then there's the new beginning, where you kind of unveil your new self and kind of add a new chapter to your life story. Now let's so let's use the pandemic as an example. Well, the point I want to make before I get to the pandemic is, for a hundred years of thinking about transition, going back to this anthropologist, Arthur Arthur Van Gannep hundred years ago who first invented this idea, he said, you must, everybody said, you must do them in order. Hmm. Well, that also turned out to be bunk. Like Van Gennep said, it was like, it's like leaving one room and then walking down a hallway and then walking into a new room, which is very vivid, but not what it's like. Because the truth is you like, you walk into the hallway, like, well, I'm not ready for that. And then you like go back into the old room and then you go run down the hallway and peek in the new room, but oh, I'm not ready for that either. You go back to the hallway. Like people do them in a non-linear way. Like imagine if you're getting divorced, like some people have already started a new relationship before they leave the old one. Or let's just say you get divorced and then you go through the messy middle and then you start a new relationship, but you have children with <laughs> in the old relationship. There's always a part of you that's there kind of co-parenting um, if you're lucky enough to be doing that amicably, you know, with an old partner. 
So the point is life is nonlinear and even these stages are nonlinear. And I would say a good example of that is the pandemic. So when the pandemic first happened, here we are, it's in March, more or less next week. I think most of us thought, okay, I'll stay inside, we'll mitigate and I'll, I'll go back to the old life, okay? Well, now we know that we're not going back to the old life, but we actually sort of went in some ways to the new normal before we said goodbye to the old life. And so here's a good example that we were sort of in the messy middle before we'd said goodbye. Now we're beginning to sort of what is the new beginning and I'm not sure we fully said goodbye. So here's an example that we're now in it. And I think the point that you raised about it being potentially beneficial is really important. A life transition is painful, right? There's a reason that there's a messy middle, that it's messy. There's a reason Abraham has to leave his father's house and go into the wilderness that he doesn't know. There's a reason that the Israelites, let's remember what happens. Okay, now I'm starting to preach here because I'm talking to a preacher, but they cross the Red Sea and then they're like, we're ready. I mean, I've been there, trust me. I've spent a lot of time in the Sinai. I've written three books about it and made a TV show. It takes about, I don't know, a couple of days to drive from Cairo to Gaza, how you'd get into Israel. Why mm -hmm. are they there 40 years? Because when they cross the bridge, they're like, oh, we want to go back. By the way, speaking of the long goodbye, like we, they want to go back into slavery because there's because the onions yeah. were good. That's like what it says. Yeah. Um, and then it's God who says, no, no, no. Not only do you need to be in the wilderness, but I'm going to make you stay for 38 more years until you actually say goodbye. And then you do the work of becoming a nation before you go into the new land. So again, this is a story that was 3,000 years old that we're still talking about because the truth of it is it's going to be difficult. But to your point, there can also be renewal. There can also be growth. There can also be creativity. And I'll just use one more example from the pandemic. What was the, if March was the shock last year, what was the big story of April? Like what was the number one cliche on social media? What did we all do? We baked, okay? Yeah. Like we were gonna sourdough our way through the pandemic. And I may have been the only person in America who was not surprised because that's creativity. That's the act of imagining that if I get my hands messy, and by the way, with sourdough, because you couldn't get yeast up here in the Northeast, at least, um, I can make a loaf of bread. And just looking at that bread and eating it and sharing it allows me to imagine that I'm going to be able to make a new version of myself. Mm. This is finally over. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. It's interesting when you were talking about um, children of Israel coming out, crossing over into the wilderness. Uh, there, there's, I feel like I'm letting your children down. I'm, I'm encouraging you to preach too. Like, and they're, they're, <laughs> they're rolling their eyes at both of us now. But anyway, keep going. Do <laughs> well, your thing, Rev. <laughs> the, the story, um, the, the story is well known to people in a lot of different, you know, faith traditions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, primarily. But there is a way in which while the story may be the same, how we understand the story uh, can be dramatically different. Um, in, in reading a lot of the stuff that you were writing and uh, not going to pick a fight about stages of grief and stuff like that, uh, unless we need to have some fun with that. But a fight. There, I'll, I'll, there, I'll there's a sense that. in which there are things that are prescriptive and things that are descriptive. Oh, right. And when you talked about the children of Israel being there 40 years, that story was taken and then overlaid to some degree well, that's because God said we had to weed out all the bad people before they could cross over and Moses didn't get to go, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe, but then there's also a sense in which something like that did happen. And so now we're into, you know, a part of uh, the conversation about these, these stages uh, that are the tools that you give, yeah. that, that when you give them, you do give them in a degree to which they can be prescriptive. But I think one of the things that you do, uh, and it's a little bit more playful and a little bit more inviting, is you give them as descriptors. And you, and you say clearly, it's not that all eight of these are going to be for everybody. Some of them won't do anything for you. But here they are. Um, take and pick the ones that work for you. Don't get caught up. You know, I, I was joking earlier, you know, the whole denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, sort of Kubler-Ross stages of grief. Um, one of his, her students uh, has recently written a book where he adds a stage and says that in their in the end of her life, they were talking about this, but she didn't write it, of meaning making. Hmm. And that the idea is not, and for me, I, I spent a couple of years as a hospice chaplain. And so 
this this notion of you know you've got to go through denial and then anger and then bargaining and then depression and finally you get to acceptance well no it doesn't work but having those things as a way to empathize with people so that when they are in a place of denial you can say it's okay that's yes. part of of what might happen rather than it being laid out of a b c d it's more these things are here when you need that one hold on to that for a little bit and then when you need the other. So uh, hopefully, I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about- Okay, um, so that's, first of all, that's, that's a very subtle reading of this and I'm grateful for it. I, I'm just chuckling because I got a call yesterday from the social scientist who's writing a book about these kinds of events and had read my book. He's like, I'm a, like, I'm a social scientist. Like, I'm, I'm told to like package everything up as like life is and conclude that way. And your book, you're mixing social science with spirituality and it's a little confusing to me. But I, to me, that's where there's wisdom. So let me just, let me just deal with the pre preaching part of what you say, and then I'll deal with the social science part of what you say. Yeah. The thing I want to say about the Hebrew Bible and the stories of religion in general is that the growth is in the wilderness. Okay, mm -hmm. the biggest breakthroughs in the story are very clear. When Abraham leaves his father's house and goes down to the promised land, to the land he doesn't even know where it is, that introduces the idea of the, you know, the children of Abraham. When the Israelites leave slavery and go into freedom, yes, there's the 38 years that there's a lot of rebellions and violence and destruction. And, you know, God's an angry God in a lot of those scenes, but that's also where the tablets are distributed and when they become a nation and when the laws come down. Even then when they get on the land and they go by the rivers of Babylon and they weep and they have been exiled from the land, that's where Shabbat is introduced. That's where the idea of synagogue comes together, where, where, where challah and those kinds of traditions are begun. And when they later go into the diaspora, off into Persia. So the great breakthroughs, whether it's Jesus then off into Jesus going to Egypt, Jesus uh, into the desert, Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, uh, the, uh, the Buddha going into, you know, going, uh, sitting out in the forest or, you know, the, on and on and on and on. There are these stories of people who leave the civilized world, go into the wilderness, have a transforming experience and come back. That is the fundamental shape of a transition. And it's, and by the way, Orpheus, Odysseus, Jason, Hercules, all those stories too. So that is that. The, the point that you made, and since you said you weren't gonna pick a fight and then did pick a fight, I'll swing back. The problem <laughs> with the five stages of grief is a, a many, but first of all, they had nothing to do with grief. The five stages of grief were actually originally what Kubler-Ross found in talking to people a la hospice when they were dying. And so those were ideas that people were going through as they were reconciling their own upcoming death that they knew about, as opposed to say dying in a plane crash. Um, and then they later jumped to grief, but they, had, they were not originally from grief interviews, they were originally from death and dying interviews. That's the, in fact, the book, of course, was called on death and dying. Yeah. The problem is not the emotions, it's the prescription that you must do them in this order. Right. That's the legacy, when she came up with this in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken, the, the legacy of that was that you must do them in order. And as, as Bonanno, this Columbia researcher I quote in my book, talks about a lot of people, if you were my friend and you had just lost a loved one, and then you and I were sitting down and I'm like, well, did you ever feel denial? And you were like, no. And I'm like, and then I would be saying to you, well, then you're doing it wrong, Patrick. Like you then yeah. have to go seek help. That's the, go talk to your reverend or your pastor or your therapist or your mother because you're not doing it right. That's the problem. Now the language of grief is everybody grieves in their own way and their own process. And you should be respectful of that. You may go through these phases in order, but you may not. And we can't just say there's only one way. That leads to the tools. And so, yes, I found these tools. And what I found was these are the things that people did. No one did all seven. Mm -hmm. Everybody kind of wanted to know what everybody else was doing, but they didn't have anyone to ask. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm like here. And the thing is, yes, what you said was so, so subtle and perceptive because I'm not wagging my finger and telling you that this is what you should do. I am showing you other people and this is what they did in the hopes that you can find in there an idea, now that we see it's working in the marketplace, is that, that relates to me. And so what are the tools? I'll just give you an example. The first one is accept it because it's an emotional experience. Mm -hmm. I look 225 people in the eye and I say, what's the biggest emotion that you struggled with in your transition? Number one, fear. Can I get through it? 
How can I pay the bills? How can I live without this loved one? What am I gonna do without my leg? Fear. Number two, sadness, grief. Like I miss having a job. I, I, I miss those days when I could meet my loved ones and I didn't have to sit inside during the pandemic. Like I, uh, I miss being with that person. I much preferred when I could see before I've gone blind. The third one I found interesting, which was sh is shame. Hmm. I'm ashamed I need help. I'm ashamed I can't pay my bills. I'm ashamed that what I did when I was drinking too much. I'm ashamed that my child has an anxiety disorder. And a simple question at the supermarket, how are the kids? I don't want to answer. And that's too torturous for me. So how do you process that emotion? Which is the next question I ask. You know, some people write it down. Some people do what I do, which is buckle down, right? And go to work. But eight out of 10 use rituals in some way. Mm -hmm. they, they hold services, they hold farewell parties, they, they raise a glass of, of champagne or non-alcoholic champagne, they bury something in the backyard, they jump out of an airplane, they do these rituals to say, yeah, I'm going through it. It's a way of saying to yourself and to everyone around you, I'm going through a difficult time and I'm going to sort of acknowledge that it's difficult. My wife just came in 30 minutes ago. She's got a bunch of stuff happening in her professional life that the details of which are not important. In this case, they actually happen to be mostly good things, but she's overwhelmed. And she came in like, oh, I just got this call and I've got to respond to this. And I got this email. And I was like, you know what you need to do, Linda? You need to acknowledge that you're in a, a, an emotional, transforming, transitional, complicated, heavy stage. Mm. And the worst thing you can do Back to my saying, she would have made it 217 times to do this. Is make a decision tonight. Yeah, you know, take it. This is, just say out loud that this is a complicated emotional time, and even doing that will give you permission to approach the whole moment in a different way. Yeah. Oh, I got a little um, caught up in 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 sort of listening to that, and um, I I'm I'm cognizant of the time. And I know when we talked earlier that uh, one of the things that you mentioned was that you had more than one Pat Conroy story, um, you know, recognizing that this is March 4th, we are 15, 18 minutes away uh, from, you know, the fifth anniversary of his death uh, and, and his, his ability to collect stories um, and then to, you know, give those to the rest of us was, you know, just such a wonderful and incredible thing. Um, tell us a little bit about your connection with Pat or, or some, of, uh, some of the memories that you have of how that influenced your life. So here's a transition for you. So we were talking about the tools of, of going through a life transition. There's seven tools and, they, and most of them are vaguely associated with the stage. They accept it and mark it, that's the long goodbye. The messy middle is shedded and created some, you know, the baking or painting or dancing or baton twirling, those kinds of things. And the last two are tell it, uh, unveil it, like share with others that you're going through this transition and then tell it, add a new story. But there's one that happens at all times and that's share it. And so I, that's don't go through it alone, like find somebody that can help you. Hmm. So what I realized in talking to people about people who influence them in their lives and their difficult times is there are different types of support. Okay, there's what I call comforters, like I love you, Patrick. You'll get through it. I believe in you. There's nudgers, like I love you, Patrick, but oh, why don't you try this? Or like why don't you try that? And then there's slappers, and a slapper is I love you, Patrick, but you've been saying this for two years now, and I'm really tired of hearing it. And like go get your butt and do X, Y, now. Go to AA. Get on you know, get on match.com and start dating, you know, like get on the Peloton and like start losing that weight. So that's a slapper. But there's another kind, and I almost didn't mention this. And that is in the book because I, it was it seemed different because people kept telling me that there were people that they didn't know who shaped their life in some way. Mm. Uh, someone that they hadn't met. Um, and it was particular, like, like there were a lot of people, for example, who might have been LGBTQ, who didn't know someone when they grew up, and they would see a celebrity and those people. And I called this in my book, a modeler. Mm. That's what Pat Conroy was to me. Mm. Pat and I came from completely different backgrounds. Uh, what we shared in a lot of ways was that this kind of font of storytelling, of using stories, of making meaning. His challenges, my challenges, his dreams, my dreams were different in a lot of ways, 
but it was the idea that storytelling was the coin of the realm. So I mentioned earlier that I went to Japan. So I, that occurred in, um, in January of 1986. And I, I, I was thinking about it because I got, I landed in Japan the day that the, um, was it the Challenger, the one that the the the, the one that exploded the yes. space Because this was the whatever whatever anniversary it was from 1986, yes. it was like 35 years or whatever that is. Um, and I started writing these letters home, as I said, and I got back later, and people write, and, and so then I went back to Japan after graduating, and that I believe it was the summer before I went to Japan, I got a copy of The Water Is Wide. Now, the movie, of course, Conrack is, is basically in the ancient history here, but I reread that book because that's a book about young Pat Conroy going out to teach a population that for him might have been his year abroad on, you know, on <laughs> Defusky. I mean, it was not exactly like my students in Japan, and yet exactly was like my stories in Japan, except I didn't get fired like Pat did. Um, um, <laughs> but the idea that somebody from the and I was and I was reading it where on Tybee Island where I spent a lot of time growing up and as anybody who's read my work maybe a lot of people who haven't I actually have a daughter my identical daughters are Eden for the Garden of Eden in Tybee mm. and um and I was on Tybee when I read I can remember looking out over the water and sort of feeling this sort of kinship with the idea that you can come from this place and you can use these colors and this palette Right, the coinage of sand dollars. Right, you can, you can, the, the, the these things can become the ideas and visuals and smells that can populate you. And then um, I did. I tried for many years to meet Pat, and I knew a lot of people who knew him. Rosemary Danielle was a kind of a big influence of mine later, but it didn't happen. Um, and now I'm going to tell a story I've never told publicly, and I'm actually now going to read something that has never been read publicly. I mentioned earlier that my dad has written 52,000 words of stories in response to questions. And he's written this book. And this is the first page. And my father is watching tonight. And with his indulgence, uh, the, I should say without his permission, I'm now going to read the opening page of my father's memoir. And my father's memoir is called A Professional Savannian. And by the way, if you want to read it someday when we publish it, go to my site and send me an email, because uh, we're going to get that done. On one, two, three, four, five, that's one dash, two dash, three dash, four dash, five, I was 10 years old. I was proud of that fact and loved to share it. I was born on January 23rd, 1935 in Savannah, Georgia. And my life in one way or another has revolved around this city, which I love and which my family has been a part of for more than a century and a half. Savannah helped define my values, my outlook on life, my politics, my religion, my business life, my family, my children, and my grandchildren. And then skipping down a paragraph, once in the early 1990s, I attended a party in Atlanta for Southern writers hosted by celebrated chef and cookbook author, Natalie Dupree. Mm. As I was leaving the party, my grown sons, Andrew and Bruce, by the way, he doesn't note that I'm the reason he got invited to that party, but whatever, uh, commented <laughs> that my habit of highlighting Savannah reflected my pride in where I was from. I'm a professional Savannian, I said in response. The nickname stuck. It's an honor I have been proud to carry. I hope these stories capture in some small measure the many ways in which this storied community has woven through my family, my work, and my life. Mm. So I printed that out because that's the party where I met Pat Conroy. So Pat was a guest uh, at that party. And I quite remember, like I was like eating something, you know, and something's falling out, you know, and I'd spent, you know, a long time in my life trying to meet Pat and Pat was there. And he, in that way that he was, and I have no idea if it was bluster or truth, but he was like, Bruce, I just love your writing, right? I mean, I, 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 I'm sure it wasn't true. Don't tell me it wasn't true. I, I believed it wasn't true, but I really wanted to believe it. And it was that way he had of just sort of saying, you and I are of a piece and that we are similar and we came from these different worlds. And it meant a tremendous, tremendous um, amount to me. And, um, how many years later was it? It was in 2002. So let's just say that was a decade later. Walking the Bible had come out. That had become a big thing. It's been a year and a half on the bestseller list. Um, I made a TV series about it for PBS. And then after 9-11, I was in New York and I watched the Twin Towers fall. And I realized at that moment that the world felt that we were in this crisis of interreligious dialogue. And I said, <laughs> my wife tells the story, 
that we were at a dinner at a, at a lunch four days later on that five days later on that Saturday, 9-11 was a Tuesday. And I was like, this all Abraham, this all goes back to Abraham. Like this is Abraham as a shared ancestor of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. This is the greatest family feud in history. And I got to write about this and everyone's nodding along. And I'm like, trust me, like a year from now, Abraham will be on the cover of Time Magazine. And then everybody was like, they were like, what are you talking about? Well, Abraham was on the cover of Time Magazine uh, a year later, because I put him there, because I wrote this book on Abraham. And in response to that, I was invited to this event called the Southern, uh, the Southeastern Booksellers Association, SIBA. And so we could, somebody can figure this out. That was 2002. Was that beach music? I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I remember uh, what book it was, or maybe it was uh, my, my, my Strong Season, the, the Basque, whatever it was. A losing so, Season. Uh, yeah, I think that's the book that came out at that time. So yeah. there were a series of, there was like a lunch talk, a, a dinner talk, and a breakfast talk, okay? And Pat was the headliner, and I was the warm-up act, okay? And I rem and, and so I had to give the same speech over and over again in front of Pat, right? And so I remember at the lunch, the first one of these, um, that I stood up and gave this speech. Now that you've heard me talk very fast, it was probably like a 10-minute speech in five minutes or whatever it was I gave and I had to step down off the dais and then walk by Pat in order to get back to my chair with the you know the whatever cheesecake and the cold salad and whatever and I walked by and Pat leans over and he's like best damn speech I ever heard and like I I almost didn't I was like wobbly need I almost didn't make it back <laughs> to my to my seat and so I think that the thing I want to say about Pat is everybody I know who's ever met him has much better stories than I do. Like everybody he meets. I talked to someone today, I'm actually working on a new set of interviews. I talked to someone today who actually was in the Savannah Book Festival and was like, Pat was estranged from the Savannah Book Festival. And then I had to go out to lunch with him and talk him to come in back to the Savannah Book Festival. And just about how warm that embrace was. Mm. And so Pat was so, we all know the stories. We all know the pain and dysfunction and challenge that he came out of and it made him so open and open-minded and so just instinctually welcome, welcoming of everybody. And so therefore I, back to my preacher hat for here for a second, um, I, I, don't, I won't say it's a mistake, but I don't, I don't remember this part of the, of the book of Exodus when, when, when Moses comes down, he's like, I got the tablets, but before I read you the tablets, you got to agree in advance to do whatever they say, or I'm not going to read them to you. When Jonathan asked me if I would speak at March 4th, I was like, I think I'm going to make a mistake, but I'm going to agree in advance to say yes to whatever request you ever make of me uh, involving Pat Conroy. Uh, that's beautiful. That's great. That's great. Um, I am looking at the clock and, and uh, there's a, a couple of more things that I had written down um, that I kind of wanted, I, I, a couple of things I wanted to share, uh, sort of read you back to you. Um, if you've want to comment, that's great. But I really um, am thinking more in terms of uh, back to what I was saying at the beginning, I, I really think that, um, you know, this, this particular work that you've done, it elicits compassion and empathy. And you reference that a part of your purpose in doing this is to offer people these kinds of tools, um, which, you know, I think are uh, invaluable, but also it uh, really, really important right now. Um, it's going to get crazier, I think. Uh, you know, we're not going, the whole nonlinear life is going to continue to spiral in different ways where we're going to need to find ways to connect, to love each other, and to care more. And one of the things that you do in this book is at the end, and I know you have this on your website as well, is you give us the tools to engage people that we know and also people perhaps that we don't know uh, with a series of questions that then create the space in between to connect with each other. So I just wanted to, you know, do that as a kind of like, hey, y'all get that's that's towards the back. It's it's there in the appendix. Um, but and it, you write this in the book and I, I just wanted to share it. Uh, the larger point here is worth emphasizing. We have a choice in how we tell our life story. We do not write it in permanent ink. There are no points for consistency or even accuracy. We can change it at any time for any reason, including one as simple as making ourselves feel better. After all, a primary function of our life story is to allow us to place experiences firmly in the past 
and to take from them something beneficial that will allow us to thrive in the future. Only when that happens will we know our transition is complete. Um, and then a little bit later, a little bit further, uh, a few pages beyond, you said we need to return to the campfire and we can. It's as simple as saying to someone, tell me the story of your life. And when they're finished, say, I'd like to tell you mine. Whatever happens next, both of you will emerge with a story to tell of your encounter and a new meaningful experience you share. And I, I don't imagine that you did that just to completely crib from, from Pat Conroy, but if you come to the Conroy Center, you will see that uh, on one of the, the posters that's kind of leading you into the building, it has a picture of Pat Conroy and it literally just says, tell me a story. And that resonance between the work that you have done and that you're doing and the life that he lived uh, in terms of, you know, collecting stories and acquiring stories, because every time he told, he invited someone to share their story, if you knew anything about him, you knew, be careful because it's, he's going to use it. It's, it's going to come back. So, uh, but when somebody inquires don't tell after people. you, don't, don't, don't let them in on that, Pat. I, say, I still need people to tell me stories because I'm like Pat. I can't make them up anywhere near to that. Near to <laughs> but, but anytime you you inquire with you know a sense of curiosity about someone else, you are are giving them a a, a validation of of who they are, and that what they have to say is is worthwhile, and and that comes through in your work, there was a sense in which all the stories that you were telling that carried from one idea to the next idea, you could feel, I could feel, this is someone who, who cares about what people are saying. And from that caring, then offers to us an opportunity um, to do some self-work, but also to do work with others. So uh, in, in that respect, I think um, as one of, the, one of the lines that you, you talk about in the book uh, with some frequency is the need for repair and to repair uh, narrative, I think is perhaps how you put it, but do you, you, you remember what I'm talking about? So let me, there's a lot there and it's so beautiful. You're such a ge generous reader and good soul. Those who, those who get to be in community with you and go through pain with you and, and learn with you. I, I know um, what a gift you are to the low country and I'm, and I'm honored that you've spent that time thinking about my work. I'm especially honored by the connection to Pat, mm -hmm. one of the great storytellers um, in American history. Um, but let's pause on this for a second. You know, we all have the story that goes on in our head about who we are and where we came from and who we want to be, what our dreams are. It's kind of always running low in the background. And one thing we've learned in the last generation is that that story isn't just part of us, it is us in a mm. fundamental way, that life is the story that you tell yourself. And I'm often asked like, you know, how did you find these people and why did they tell you the things? Because as you saw, there's a parade of incredible life events. I talked to people who were in cults and people who got sober and got out of bad marriages. And I mean, the stories are it'll actually, if you're going through a difficult time, it'll make you feel like grateful for all the difficult things you're not dealing with. Um, but there's still no fundamentally, no greater drug than someone look you in the eye and saying, you know, tell me your story. And there's no greater gift than opening up and listening to that story. Mm -hmm. And a story can take two people who have no relation and give them a relationship for life. And, uh, but it requires actually being still and listening. So you said, yes, that I had a, a template that I use for these life stories at the end of life is in the transitions. I do offer it there. What you're referring to on my website, if you go to BruceFire.com and there's a tic-tac-toe board at the beginning and the yellow box in the middle, if you click on that, I actually now have a way that I can email you a question every Monday morning, like I did with my dad. And it's been way more popular than I expected. People asking their loved ones or parents or aging parents or grandparents to do it, to tell these stories. Because what you, what you, meant, what you said about repair is the way to think about this is that a life quake, and we've all, we're all on a life quake right now, is fundamentally a narrative event. The story we've been telling about who we are has been ruptured in some way. And the only way to repair that rupture is with a new story in which you add a chapter that we went through this pandemic and we suffered this, we learned this, we experimented with this and we came out like this. So you've added a new story with some sort of positive ending. 
Because the fundamental thing at the end of the day that I learned is that we have these stories we tell ourselves, but our stories are to a way we don't often appreciate shaped by the earliest stories that we know. There's all these scriptural stories for anybody who grew up in a religious context or the kind of great mythologies of the, of the Western world for someone who grew up reading those stories. But the earliest stories we hear are fairy tales. And fairy tales have a main character and they have a happy ending. And that's what we all want. But that's not what makes it a fairy tale. What makes it a fairy tale is that the main character, the hero has to go through the woods. And what happens in the woods is they encounter a wolf or an ogre or a dragon or a downsizing or a death or a tornado or a pandemic. Mm. And we want to close our eyes when the scary part started, when the wolf appears, but you can't because that's when the heroes are made and the hero has to learn how to get over, around, or through. The Italians have this great expression that I love, the wolf and the fairy tale, lupus and fabula. And it's like just when everything is going well, here shows up uh, the wolf. And so, but that's the important thing that we all want to and need to be the hero of our story. And in order to do so, we have to learn to slay the wolf. And so my message to you is if you're going through a difficult time now, if you lay in bed last night worrying or had a cup of coffee and sat this morning uh, wondering how you were gonna get through it, I was where you were. I went out and met people that were way worse and their stories is what gave me hope and hope in a general sense, but also as you said, and have said so kindly over and over again, practical things you can do this week or next week or the week after to get through it. So come on this journey with me. We can, we can meet some wolves and learn some new techniques that will help, them, help us slay them. And we can get through this together. There is a way if we do it uh, with one another. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think that that probably uh, is a wonderful, uh, literally good word, benediction that you've offered for us. Uh, and I appreciate the work that you've done. Look forward to, to what will be coming next. And hopefully we'll find uh, a way and a time uh, where we're able to see each other and not looking through a screen. Um, all of the folks uh, I'm looking up and down the chat are, you know, kind of spread out all over the country. But for those of us who are here in the in the low country, um, look forward to the times when you will make your way back into this part of the world. And uh, meanwhile, we all have the good fortune of being able to access your work through uh, the books that you've written and through the website that you offer um, that particular, you know, tool to go back and forth and be able to hear our stories, tell our stories, inquire after uh, one another as to stories, and um, and then do the work, the work uh, for and with each other. So thank you. I really, really appreciate what you've done and um, look forward to reading and, and getting to know more about what you have, uh, what you'll be offering. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. I still didn't hear that invitation to dinner at the Perrymans, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll think that it's there. And thank you, Jonathan, and, and uh, hats off to all the community in and around the Pat Conroy uh, Literary Center in Buford and the work you're doing to inspire you know, future people to go out and tell their stories, which is um, what we all want and what we all need and we, what we all can benefit from. So good night, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us.